Hey there, oh Lodgerinos. This video is dedicated to Mackey, Albuquerque's alertest boxing referee. The guy doesn't miss a thing, and neither will you after we dig into the images and artistry of some great TV together. It's about time. Let's have another basement breakdown. Better Call Saul Season 6, Episode 5, Black and Blue. I'm going to start at the beginning. Let's take a look at the cold open, starting with this first shot, this first bit of motion. From a blurry, largely colorless void, a technician emerges, sliding open the door of this cabinet. The motion of the door opening coordinates perfectly with the shift of the focal plane to direct our attention to the bottles, while also giving this tantalizing glimpse of the person. Who is this? What is he making? Those become the operative questions, and the camera work heightens that itch of curiosity in the space of these first couple seconds. One thing we naturally notice in this composition is the orderliness, right? So many things are duplicated. The blue bottles, the orange-capped jars, these ominous test tubes filled with blood red and adorned with fire. The doubling and fastidious arrangement of the containers gives us the sense of an orderly repeating process. This guy is doing something he's done before and will do many times again. Keep looking and you'll find more visual pairs. The bands on the stickers, the hazard icons, there's even a pair of red herrings on the only label with legible text, namely the jar of methyl methacrylate. I think I got that right. There's two meths in there. Obviously, this guy's making meth. I think this is what most of us naturally assume the first time we see this sequence. We're all reasonably confident it's meth. We're watching along thinking, yep, there's the uh, meth solution. Then you add the meth powder, of course, mix it up, and it makes the meth goo. That's how you do it. We know because we watched Breaking Bad, so <laughs> I think we know how meth is made. Then that slide rule goes into the goo, and hmm, now we're not so sure it's meth anymore. Either this is some sort of math meth, or it's something else altogether. Probably not math meth, but a man can dream. Clearly the product being made here is a more sentimental item than we initially assumed. It's important that we see in this extreme close-up that the slide rule is weathered. It's a bit grimy from use. It has a patina, that telltale veneer of humanity, and that makes it stand out in this largely sterile environment. It shows signs of life, and so when the slide rule ends up encased in plastic, we understand that life is being preserved in some way and perpetuated in this symbolic fashion. It turns out that that methy goo is actually just a medium for this slide rule, or more to the point, the character represented by the slide rule, which is our old friend Werner, as we come to understand by the end of the episode. Now, a slide rule is a device to quickly estimate complex calculations by hand. It's an antique in the 21st century, but no less useful for its purpose. Evidently, it was a well-worn piece in Werner's tool set. Brenner was no Luddite, no stranger to the latest technologies, but he was more analog than digital. He was the kind of craftsman who needed to verify the numbers by hand to get a more intuitive feel for them, literally. So the slide rule embodies an endearing blend of technical acumen and human touch. These are the qualities that Werner's boys loved in him. With love, your boys, reads the inscription. And it's a fitting tribute to the engineer who could build a meth super lab but who just couldn't help missing his wife. You want to see your wife? More than anything, then finish the job. That need for the human touch was both the beauty of the character and his downfall. That's how great tragedy often works. It's a very effective way to write a tragic story to have the thing we find beautiful about the character also be what lays them low. So the initial resemblance of this scene to the meth-making process is a playful misdirection, but it's also not entirely a misdirection. It does draw a parallel, and for me that parallel is purity. If I asked you, aside from the blue color, what set Walter White's meth apart from all the others, you would probably say some version of it was the purest, because it was, and the characters were obsessed with it. They talked about it all the time. Mr. Fring, I can guarantee you uh, purity of 96%. However, this other product is 99. Maybe even a touch beyond that. 
Here, too, we see a process of purification. We watch the bubbles and fog disappear from the acrylic. We see it shaped and buffed to near invisibility by blue, gold, and finally pure white wheels. Purity is a key idea in the soundtrack as well, and I'd like to turn our attention there for a moment if I could. The music in the background is a Johannes Brahms Lied, a song called in German In Stiller Nacht, or In the Quiet Night. It's a poignant choice of song for this sequence. The lyrics are in German, of course. Here's what they mean in English. Thank you to Emily Isust for permission to use this translation. In the quiet night at the first watch, a voice began to lament. Sweetly and gently the night wind carried to me its sound. And from such bitter sorrow and grief, my heart has melted. The little flowers, with my pure tears, I have watered them all. The beautiful moon wishes to set out of pain and never shine again. The stars will let fade their gleam, for they wish to weep with me. Neither bird song nor sound of joy can one hear in the air. The wild animals grieve with me as well, upon the rocks and in the ravines. Whew, that is sad stuff. Now, I think you could already tell from the melody just listening that this is a sad song. And the lyrics reveal that it's more than a sad song. It's a song about sadness. The subject of the lyrics is a grief so profound that the moon and the stars can't even shine. And the wild animals from up on the rocks to down in the ravines, they're all dumbstruck by sorrow. Wow, this is some high test sadness. And don't forget those little flowers. With my pure tears, I have watered them all. Such a ludicrous image and such an important line. Brahms was working in the Romantic era, and one part of the Romantic ethos is an idea that art can convey and evoke emotional experience. And even more than that, it can express emotions with a revelatory purity and intensity that transcends our daily experience. It's from within that aesthetic context that we get this song about an impossibly pure sadness, a sadness which, I will note, has no name. We understand it just as an expression of emotion that carries across the breeze. That's what makes the song such a fitting choice by the producers for this Better Call Saul opener, which is, likewise, an expression of pure emotion that has no name. Crucially, Werner's name doesn't appear on the memorial, and the signature just says The Boys, not Love, Kai, Casper, and the rest of the gang. We know why they remain anonymous, to protect Gus, and by extension themselves. Permanently. Not a word, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not ever. And yet the boys have a grief that they feel compelled to express, a love that demands to be remembered. Hence this object. It's how the boys satisfy the demand of their love within the constraints of secrecy. No names. The slide rule wordlessly conveys the essence of Werner. The engraved dedication reveals nobody's identity. It simply conveys the love of these boys for their adopted father figure. Just like the grief in the song, this tribute is a nameless expression of pure emotion. Oh, except for that f***ing sticker. Nothing in this world is pure, kids. It's a lesson this fictional universe loves to teach us over and over again. Nothing is 100% pure. This other product is 99. And so this otherwise perfectly anonymous outpouring of grief is sullied just a bit by the craftsman leaving his mark on it. We eventually come to understand that the application of this sticker is a mistake, one that provides Detective Lalo with a way out of his investigative dead end. But that only comes later, right? The first time we see the sticker applied there, it seems like any other step in the process, the most natural thing in the world. And therein lies a meaningful irony. Of course a craftsman wants to sign their work. It's a natural instinct and one that Werner could never indulge. That was strictly forbidden, right? You don't discuss the Gus Fring project with the outside world. Even though, for Werner, it was a personal masterpiece. Remember the incident at the bar that one night during the boys' night out. Werner simply sketched a few diagrams on a napkin for a fellow barfly. He's a genius. Genius likes an audience, and Werner couldn't resist. Time to go. Huh? Oh my, come sit with us. Your wife's calling? And that was a prelude to the ultimate slip-up, when Werner unwittingly gave Lalo those key clues about Fring's big hole in the ground with that south wall. Certainly. They are to finish clearing the debris, then begin the south wall. That's the south wall? 
Werner was only speaking to Lalo on that hotel phone because Werner had gone AWOL to rendezvous with his wife. After months in isolation, he could no longer stand to be away from her. And this proved to be Werner's fatal mistake, quite simply loving his wife too much to be contained. Now, once again, Lalo's opportunity comes about by a love and a sorrow too powerful to be contained. This time, instead of Werner's love for his wife, it's the boy's love for Werner that provides Lalo with the lead that he needs. Oh, that German love. It is irrepressible on this show, isn't it? And unfortunately for Werner and his boys, Lalo keeps looking for that German love in all the right places. Which brings us to Germany. After that tease in the cold open, we have to wait all the way to the end of the episode to meet, for the first time, Werner's wife, Margareta. And we meet her in this curious fashion by way of this young couple playing a trivia game. The name of the game translates as Quiz Madness. Quiz Madness! Which is an apt label for the inquisitive mania that motivates Lalo as the scene develops. Let's follow the exciting trivia action here. After these two cute kids nail a question about German soccer players, they face a question about the first female astronaut. They think it's Sally Ride. Even after Margareta pipes up with the correct answer, Valentina Tereshkova, they still think it's Sally Ride. That's the power of globalized American culture. Why do the kids pick Sally? Because she's a famous American, so they've heard of her. They are charmed by the appeal and allure of the American. But Margareta apparently knows better, right? Well, that's the question when Lalo enters the scene, because what's the first detail that Lalo's alter ego, Ben, establishes about himself? You're American. I guess you could spot us a mile away. He's an American, and thanks to the lavish international lifestyle he's led, Lalo is pretty convincing in his role of Gentle Ben, the suave American businessman. With this persona, Lalo intends to charm Margareta, and because she's a widow, he intends to exploit her presumable loneliness. Notice the empty chair in the mirror next to Margareta in a number of shots, which accentuates this solitude. More to the point, consider this young couple. I think you have to read them as a vision of the young Margareta and Werner. I mean, why is Margareta eavesdropping on these two in the first place? She's not just playing along with a trivia game. She's playing along with the date. She's vicariously experiencing the young, giddy love of these two kids as a sweet echo of a now painfully distant past. So with that in mind, let's talk about this shot here. It's the first wide shot of the scene. Here's the young couple, an implicit picture of Margareta and Werner's past, as I said. And at the same time, we have in this shot pictures of their present. Look over the young woman's shoulder we see hanging on the wall a mirror with the image of Margareta. Past and present, right next to each other. Now look over the boyfriend's shoulder. And what do you see? A mounted stag, a dead male deer. That's Werner. That's Werner's present, right? Here's a wide shot from later in the evening. At this point, Werner is the topic of conversation. Over on the left, look, there's the stag taking up a large portion of the screen, shaping the geometry of the picture. And yet it's hidden in plain sight, right? You very well may not have noticed the stag at first, even though it's the biggest thing in the frame. It's not the first thing I looked at. The blurry practical invisibility of the stag gives it an ethereal presence, which is fitting to represent the ghost of a dead man. This silent beast conveys a soul whose presence is felt in the room even though he isn't there, just like the chicken door that represents Gus as the implied force shaping that scene in Hit and Run with Mike and Kim. In this wide shot, we also have that bright, throbbing glow of the quiz madness machine as Lalo peppers Margareta with questions. Lalo only gets tiny scraps of information from Margareta, but they do prove to be important clues. First, he learns that Fring's henchmen already combed through Werner's papers, so there probably isn't much to learn from them. Second, Lalo learns that Werner's colleagues sent their regrets, in particular, a few keepsakes. They sent flowers, keepsakes, and so on, but not one of them showed his face. And that sets up cat burglar Lalo's discovery of the slide rule keepsake as signed by the artist. That owl with the big eyes in the Volker mark is an inspired bit of production design. The eyes make perfect sense as the logo for a little company that makes see-through acrylic showpieces, but they also echo Lalo's characteristic all-seeing gaze. The visual echo is in play during that climactic moment when Lalo cocks his head to mirror this owl sticker, 
and then he turns and his own wide-eyed gaze becomes the subject of the shot. Lalo has seen what he needs to see, and now he needs to see his way out. He makes his exit, we're left to assume, through this opening, a window just big enough for him to fit through. And that is a perfect summary of this chapter in Lalo's story. The cover-up of Werner's death was obsessive and thorough, designed to leave not one opening for Lalo to exploit. And it was almost perfect, except for this one irrepressible expression of love from Werner's boys. That bit of love opened a just big enough window of opportunity for Lalo. And in my view, that's why the first shot of the episode features this glass sliding open, and the last shot of the episode with a matching composition shows the window sliding closed. In the intervening period, Lalo has slipped through that window. Man, that's artistry right there, these matched shots. Something this subtle, yet this beautiful, and also thematically coherent, it's something done by creators who care about the artistry and form of a thing and are willing to put in the work to bring it about on screen. To me, this is love and respect for the viewer, and it's the kind of thing that inspires my own devotion to the show. Okay, let's trace the Kim and Jimmy storyline now. The first image we see after the opening credits is this clock presented to us sideways, it's a point-of-view shot. Kim's lying on her side, okay, but really the clock's sideways because it creates a double meaning. Turn your head one way, it says 317. Turn your head the other way, it spells lie. Kim has a new lie to maintain, and it creates a new distance between her and Jimmy. The seasonal arc of the show's cycle of tragedy always includes this inexorable separation that plays out one way or another between Kim and Jimmy. The lie Kim has to keep up now is that Lalo Salamanca is dead. Of course, as you may be aware, Lalo Salamanca... Lalo Salamanca is alive. Yes, thank you, Gus. We know that. And Kim more or less knows this as well, thanks to her conversation with Mike at the Ominous Chicken Cafe. The pressure that knowledge places on Kim is dramatized by way of this chair, a very simple bit of staging to mark the beats of the scene. Why does Kim put the chair there against the door? She's paranoid about Lalo, obviously. I mean, the front door barricade is of a piece with Kim peering out the window through the peephole and so on. Except what's different about the chair is it's something Jimmy can notice, which indeed he does, right? I don't think this is an oops moment for Kim. I don't think Kim entered this haze of fear where she didn't think about Jimmy noticing the chair. My read is she was frightened enough where she felt the need to block the door, sure, but at the same time... Kim used the chair to gain some insight. She's not really alarmed when Jimmy notices the chair. She doesn't react. She just sits and watches. She's trying to gain information. She wants to use Jimmy's reaction to discern if maybe he already knows what she knows. And when we come back out to the wide shot, that cigarette is just chugging away. Kim is practically burning with anticipation as she waits to see what Jimmy does. You know, in the late 20th century, there was a concerted push in the United States, at least, to reduce the presence of cigarettes in movies and TV. I think that was a good thing for society. And at the same time, you can see why filmmakers love cigarettes. So many different effects in such a tiny package. The taut little inferno of the initial light. The wispy tendrils as Kim affects an air of nonchalance. And then, like I said, that smoke piping away in the wide shot. It directs our attention to Kim and evokes her inner state with this turbulent, intense, yet contained column of motion. Man, for establishing mood, there's nothing like a cigarette. Too bad they kill you. Nothing is pure in this world, kids. As her cigarette burns away, Kim does finally learn what Jimmy knows, and what he knows is... The nuns back in Cicero would send me to hell for saying it but Lalo Salamanca is dead thank god he's dead the nuns might not be happy to hear Jimmy say it but Kim is none too pleased herself as soon as he says thank god he's dead Kim does that thing where she clenches her jaw and gulps down another shit sandwich and the sandwich du jour is the necessary fiction she has to maintain of Lalo's demise Remember, in this scene, Kim's ears are still ringing with a heightened awareness of Jimmy's weakened state. She's still thinking about what Mike told her. Why are you telling me this and not him? Because I think you're made of sterner stuff. You're made of tougher stuff than he is. 
and here Jimmy reacts to the chair on the door by telling her how fragile and upset he remains. I was hoping it was just me. He's the goldfish blubbering about in his tank there. That fish thinks his little fish tank is the whole world. He has no idea what's going on outside those walls. And Kim decides that she can't shatter Jimmy's fish tank right now. She has to pretend that the Lalo nightmare is over, even though she now understands that they never actually woke up from the nightmare. And so the chair returns to its rightful spot, everything in its place, as Kim dutifully pantomimes the lie of getting back to normal. Howard and Cliff are glued to their chairs as Erin makes a hash of her remarks to a restive group of sandpiper-crossing litigants. One disgruntled class action member suggests he should get his own lawyer. And Erin's response is, yeah, sure, you could do that. You have every right to pursue independent legal representation. So it's not going great. And as Howard jumps up to rescue the session, his opening line is so effective at getting the audience on his side. It's great to see the next generation stepping up, isn't it? Thank you, Ms. Brill. Howard's backhanded compliment allows Aaron to save face, kind of, but his message to the crowd is unmistakable. Yes, folks, Aaron here, she certainly is young and therefore dumb. Unlike you old folks, it's so perfectly smarmy, it's the type of thing you'd expect to hear from Jimmy McGill in his silky smooth prime. And nothing makes me sadder than to see people of the greatest generation getting overcharged by some great big company. Just picture Jimmy delivering the line. It's great to see the next generation stepping up, isn't it? It fits perfectly. There's a lot of Jimmy in Howard's sales pitch. He's actually following the bitter, sarcastic advice Jimmy once gave him. You're a shitty lawyer, Howard, but you're a great salesman. So get out there and sell. Now here's Howard getting out there and selling. And if he sounds like Jimmy, well, why not cop Jimmy style? This is, after all, the class action that originated with Jimmy. Go to hell, Howard. I'm not giving you my case. If Jimmy hadn't self-destructed at Davis and Maine, it might be him at the front of this room. In fact, the last time we saw Jimmy before a Sandpiper Crossing audience, he had basically the same goal, which was to convince the seniors to be patient. He even, like Howard, used Aaron as an unwitting foil. You took advantage of poor Mrs. Landry. Did she know how much money you're going to make from this? Nope. Of course, in Jimmy's case, he was trying to undo the damage of his earlier swindle, and he had to pull this ugly heel turn that shook his friend's faith in humanity. Come on, girls. Howard, meanwhile, manages to convince his audience without all the deception or the mess. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye now. Howard is the good version of Jimmy, quite simply, the cleaned up version. With as much heartache and ruin as the McGill brothers have caused him, Howard has somehow nonetheless managed to learn from both of them, He's taken the best from both of them, and applied those lessons toward his own success. Imagine someone spitting this advice in your face. So get out there and sell. And then saying, you know what? I will do that. Fuck you, Jimmy. There you go. Use that. That's Howard. So the seniors leave the meeting happy with Howard's spin on things. The lawsuit stays on schedule and Howard gets to kick back and enjoy a well-earned victory. What's that? Oh, the sound of cruel irony? Oh, right. I almost forgot about Cliff. See, as the scene plays out, we intercut between the seniors' growing acceptance of Howard and Cliff's rather more complex reaction. I think Ed Begley plays this scene so nicely, he portrays Cliff holding his breath on the edge between relief and terror. Relief that, yeah, it's going well, and terror that, at any moment, a hooker might crash through the nearest plate glass window. The cruel irony here is that the same vibrating magnetic energy that Howard uses to command the room in Jimmy McGill fashion also serves for Cliff as further evidence that Howard is doing drugs. Howard, there's no harm in asking for help. You got a lot of people in your corner. This tension comes to a head out in the parking garage where Cliff recaps the latest installment in the Jimmy McGill prostitution theater. And Cliff cites the crucial evidence he saw. It was your Jaguar, your namaste plate, it was you. Of course, as we all know by now, Howard's license plate doesn't say namaste, it says namaste three. Cliff, like most people, doesn't really notice the three, just as he doesn't notice the third parties who are manipulating his relationship with Howard. 
even as Howard states what to him is the plain truth. It's just not the problem you think. I have a Jimmy McGill problem. Jimmy McGill? You'll have to excuse me. Howard! He also realizes that there's no way to make Cliff see that truth. Cliff cannot see three. He's experiencing an echo of a father-son story, the father and the drug-addicted son, and that two-person narrative is so compelling, so keenly felt by Cliff. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's the kind of thing my son used to say. That there's no way he's going to entertain Howard's more complicated, less plausible three-person version of events. When Howard says what's really going on, he sounds kind of crazy. Of course. (laughs) Of course which is a quality of the best Jimmy McGill mind games, Jimmy wants the mark to figure it out, because when they say the truth out loud, it it's makes them sound crazy. The fact that the I am not crazy! Deals a fatal blow to their credibility. He worked this angle with his brother Chuck. I know he swapped those numbers. I knew it was 1216. One after Magna Carta. As- and now he's working that angle with his brother from another mother, Howard. Howard senses this. He sees how he has been maneuvered into a position of weakness. Hence this showy display of righteous scheduling. Julie, cancel my week. Does Howard really need a whole week to rent a boxing gym? Not exactly. The writers often use Howard's dialogue as a vehicle for puns. And I'll have the soul. And butter, side of steamed veggies? You got me. Creature of habit. Here they have Howard cancel his week. Yes, my whole week. Because to him, he's resolved to cancel his week, W-E-A-K, with a show of strength. Of course, there's comedy in the fact that when Howard wants to cancel his week, he tells his assistant to do it for him. Julie, cancel my week. Howard is not the stuffed shirt he once was, but he's not not that stuffed shirt either. By way of Howard's need for a display of strength, we arrive at the boxing scene. As I said, the Sandpiper Crossing scene in this episode revisits the idea of Howard as the good Jimmy. The Jimmy who Jimmy could be if Jimmy made all the right choices. The lawyer Jimmy could be. The brother Jimmy could have been. And that sibling rivalry is the spirit that informs the brother's boxing text we see on the wall at the gym. It's a descriptor for this scene. I'm tired of this. Aren't you? It's exhausting. Let's punch it out. Howard's goodness means that Howard can conduct all of his business out in the open. He doesn't have to sneak around in the shadows like Jimmy. The baggie of drugs at the country club. The clients you sent to discredit me. That's the distinction that Howard is here to draw as he stands in the blue light and addresses the dimly lit figure of Jimmy. A boxing match is the opposite of sneaky. It's an earnest face-to-face confrontation. This seems to be a matter of honor for Howard. He needs to show that, unlike Jimmy, he's decent enough to confront his enemies face-to-face. That way, Howard feels justified when he walks back outside and resolves to sneak around behind Jimmy's back. That, to me, is what's driving Howard here, justification of a decision already made. I'm trying to give you what you want. What I want, I don't... I think this is what you want question of what drives Jimmy is a little less clear. Just ask Jimmy. I let him suck me into his game. Why'd I do that? Jimmy is vague on his motivations for participating in the boxing match, and to some degree, so am I. Kim's explanation is not much help on account of she doesn't really care in the first place. Because you know. You know what's coming next. Who boy, that is some clunky foreshadowing. Kim, you might as well just look in the camera and say, To be continued, everybody. That said, I do find it funny and in keeping with her character that Kim couldn't care less about Jimmy's angsty question. Why'd I do that? But as viewers, we do care because it's a good question. What was his motivation for fighting Howard? It's somewhat hazy. Here's my read. I think the most enticing bait that Howard dangles out for Jimmy is this idea that Jimmy must have gotten into a few scrapes back in Cicero. You must have gotten into a few good scrapes in the old neighborhood. Yeah, right. I could have been a contender. Jimmy scoffs at this, his typical defensive instinct, but Howard's remark does change the color of the matter. It's one thing for Howard to thrive in the blue world among the legal eagles of Albuquerque. It's another thing for him to beat Jimmy on slipping Jimmy's turf. Howard goads Jimmy with the implication that, even though it's Howard's gym, a fist fight is Jimmy's turf, Jimmy's game they'd be playing. 
Indeed, Howard has proven right in a way, isn't he? At the climax of the fight, Jimmy, having been provoked from his clownish antics into true anger, pulls a very Cicero maneuver on Howard. You can tell by the sudden quickness of the move that Jimmy has done this before. It's an old instinct snapping into action. And by the way, not for nothing, what the hell is Mackie doing here? You're not going to call that Mackie? Is this moment what Howard was waiting for, for Jimmy to fight dirty? To expose in the crucible of the boxing ring his true contempt for Howard and his contempt for a sense of decency for the rules? I think, yes, Howard needed this all laid bare, complete with a witness. Howard certainly brings the match to a swift conclusion after Jimmy lands that dirty blow. It seems like Howard's seen enough at that point. And by his own accounting, what he saw was just what he expected. How'd it go? <sighs> Pretty much as expected. So, we're on? Yes. Before he could feel justified in his sneaky, shadowy plan of trailing Jimmy with a private eye, Howard first needed to prove, to himself at least, that Jimmy is incapable of fighting with honor. Once Howard gets that proof that he needed, the fight is over. <laughs> As we know, the need for proof is also more explicitly a central theme in the Gus storyline, which is probably the thinnest thread of the episode. The scene in Los Pollos Hermanos is a fairly typical example of the show using the interior of a space to illustrate the interior of a character. But unlike the sequence in Gus's house, which was full of suspense and surprise, this is a pretty straightforward scene. The clockwork order of Los Pollos is fraying at the edges because so is Gus's internal clockwork order. Why is Gus fraying? Because of Lalo. And so who do we see? Lyle, the human pun. When Lalo was a source of angst for Gus, Lyle appeared, as we saw in the night of that risky DEA operation. There again is a scene that I think is a little better than this one, a scene that presented a more compelling view of Gus's psyche. This blub blub inside his head audio effect at Los Pollos isn't really doing it for me. The whole scene is strangely pat. However, the scene does conclude with Gus glowering into the Pollos parking lot, and I do like this shot, simple as it may be. Here I am, come and get me, Gus's body language seems to say. And he's out there long enough that he starts to wonder why has it? Lalo come to get me, and we start to wonder it too. Gus is uncomfortable because his instinct is to anticipate, and he's been forced into a reactive stance. They are playing, as Mike puts it, a waiting game. It's a waiting game. Gus loves a waiting game, but only when he has a trap to spring at the end of it. That's not the case here. They'll wait to see what Lalo's next move is, and then react. Gus Fring knows the way that he wins is he sees the enemy's next move before it happens. And when Gus hears Mike predict Lalo's next move... Wherever he is now, sooner or later, he's going to end up right here. Gus has an epiphany and realizes that Mike is wrong. Mike's formulation presumes that Gus is the immediate target. But if that's the case, what's the holdup? Why wasn't Gus gunned down in the parking lot? That mission would be pretty easy to accomplish, in fact, if Lalo's objective were simply to end Gus. But it hasn't happened. And as he considers this, Gus says to Mike what he realizes must be true. He can't strike. Not yet. Lalo can't strike because he doesn't have the proof he needs of Gus's larger scheme, the proof he needs to bring down Gus's empire, tearing down what a man has built. That's revenge, and Lalo needs Gus alive to see it, to witness his own ruin. Therefore, Lalo's primary target is proof. Ending Gus's life comes after that. This is Gus's insight, and that's why Gus goes to the construction site. The subterranean lab itself is the ultimate, literal, ground truth proof of Gus's secret plan to cut out the cartel. Mike says he's going to end up right here at the house because Mike's view of the situation is that Lalo's target is Gus. But Gus now believes that Lalo will show up where the proof is. This sidearm has been prominent over the last couple of episodes, consistently presented as an item of personal protection, a last line of defense for Gus, the person, right? So it's significant that in this episode, he transfers that last line of defense from himself to the proof. 
Anticipating Lalo's aims, Gus wants the proof of this lab, rather than his own body, spring-loaded with that element of deadly surprise. And so the trap is laid. Now, it's Gus Fring's sort of waiting game. I'll be upstairs. Because Gus silently dismisses Mike through some sort of telepathic drug lord command before planting the gun, we see that Gus intends to keep this latest strategic insight to himself. Gus seems to decide that he'll let Mike and his men continue to operate on the premise of personal protection, all the better to obscure Gus's true read of the situation. Because Gus knows Lalo will be watching, and he wants Lalo to see from the outside an operation that's one step behind, while Gus himself imagines that he's plotted one step ahead. And with that, the window for this basement breakdown is now closed. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Hey, I do intend to finish out the series. I know I've been super slow. I appreciate you guys keeping the faith. Bob Barker would want me to remind you to have your pets spayed or neutered. Love you, Bob. Love you guys. Namaste three. So long for now.